I'm gonna show you guys exactly how we underwrite and value land deals so we avoid ever doing bad land flips and exactly how you can learn our three-step process for underwriting vacant land. Let's dive into it. Sometimes I can't believe how much free game I give away on the internet. And today I'm gonna to show you guys the exact process that we teach Leah members on how to underwrite and do due diligence on deals. Well, really more the underwriting side. We're gonna talk about the math behind how do we figure out what a property is worth and how do we figure out what we should offer for it, okay? The due diligence process is a little deeper than that. Of course, some of it is influenced into our pricing, but we're not gonna go super deep talking about you know perk tests and nitty gritty stuff like that. Frankly, that's gonna be a whole separate video or maybe you just need to pay someone to get that information. Before we dive into it, look at if you are looking to build you know maybe a, a six figure land investing business, make a couple hundred grand on the side, we've got dozens of folks inside Leah doing that, making 100, 200K on the side. If you're looking to build a seven figure full-time business, we've also got folks inside Leah doing the same exact thing. I encourage you to raise your hand and ask for some help. If you want to compress time and get to your goals faster and remove the potholes, the minefields that can take you out of the business like this, landinvestor.co slash apply to see if you'd be a good fit. Now let's dive into it. Now, the reason this video is important is because like I just said in that little shtick, there are things in this business that can take you out of the game, like putting all your marketing dollars to bad markets, buying bad deals, and underwriting goes into how we know for buying a good deal or a bad deal. The truth is in land though, the reason there's such an opportunity here in this business is because pricing is very unknown, right? That's the reason we can go and buy deals at such crazy discounts is because most owners, most sellers, most realtors, most investors even don't really know how to value land. It's not as easy as looking at some numbers in the same county. And hopefully today I can convey that message to you. So here's a deal that we own. We bought this deal maybe about three, four weeks ago. This is out in Colorado. You might be saying, somewhere this looks landlocked. Does this deal have access? Yes, we verify this does have access. There's boundary easements and all these properties. The physical access ain't great though. We got this road here, dirt road that goes to even worse dirt road that leads to this property. It's not the worst access we've ever seen. It's not the best access we've ever seen. This road is fine enough. The problem is it doesn't actually intersect into our property. And so we're going to have to kind of account for that in our pricing. We'll talk about that here in a second. Now, the Leah playbook for comping properties is in, comes into three specific parts. The first part that I'm going to share with you, and you guys will need to stick around for the whole video to get the full three parts. The first part that I'm going to stick with you, share with you is what we call proximity. Now, this is weighted in order of importance. The way I'm outlining these is very specific, and it highlights which one is most important. So proximity is most important. So let's talk about how we figure out what that actually means. Now, first off, we're in data tree. Data tree is really, really slick because we can actually go and see recent comps, right? Like sold properties. There's only one comp right here. The beautiful thing is it's an adjacent comp. Now, I'm a big fan of getting our comps from on-market data, but I still like to look at these. I don't make pricing decisions off of these because this is just anything that's hit the county. So we don't know if those were ever listed. I like seeing stuff that's on-market. I just think I get more data. I get more of like a, a full read on what's going on here. These are still influential, but I can't build a case off of these comps. What if this was a cousin selling to his other cousin? Okay. I mean, maybe they gave him a homie hookup. What if this property has an oil field on it? And I don't know because there's no disclosure for that online. And so it sells for a million dollars. And I'm like, well, my property's worth a million dollars. I don't love these comps, but they're worth noting. Now, I will say we bought this property for $6,200 for context for those that care to know. Okay, this is a two-acre property. This is also a two-acre property. This sold for seventeen nine. dollars Cool, good to know. It's good to know because it's adjacent to ours. Proximity tells us that the most relevant comps are going to be as close to our property as possible. So an adjacent comp is going to mean infinitely more than a comp that's five miles away, even if it's a very similar property. Proximity wins because real estate and land at the end of the day is a local game. Local in terms of some parts of a neighborhood or some parts of a county are going to be better than others. That's more on a macro perspective. And on a micro perspective, talking about literally adjacent properties, well, they probably have similar features. And we're going to talk about that here next. Okay. Now worth noting that our property is a little bit nicer, right? So this property does not, it's not close to any of the roads here. Our property is much closer and our property sits a little bit better. So this sold for 79, 
you know, who knows what the backstory was there. I'm going to say our property is probably a little bit nicer though. And we'll talk about that later. So what we're going to do here to validate the proximity side of things for comping is we're going to zoom out. Now, the fatal mistake that so many people make, please don't make this mistake, is they go and start their search by looking at the county. Bad idea. We don't do that. We zoom out. We try to find the closest town. So Texas Creek, Cotopaxi, Hillside, Westcliff. My recommendation to you is use Redfin. Use Redfin for just about everything. Do not use Zillow. Don't use Realtor.com. I'm a big believer that Redfin is the best in the game. The best land investors use Redfin. It's just a lot easier to manipulate the data on here. So instead of searching the county, Fremont County, I'm going to search the city that's closest to it. Okay, so I'm going to search, in this case, Westcliff. Some of these small towns won't come up. So sometimes if you search you know, Cotopaxi, for example, it might not register on Redfin because it's just too small, a little podunk town. Is this the right Westcliff? Let's see. And one thing that we're going to do here, one thing that I'm going to do just so this runs smoothly, let's just say, hey, just show us land so it's a little bit faster. Okay, so here's Westcliff, here's Texas Creek, Hillside, Cotopaxi. And now what I'm going to do is literally line up where our property is, okay? So now we're just going to go and say our property is right here by Deer Mountain, north of Hillside. Cool, so I'm going to start my search right here. One of the silly, silly things that people do is they like, look at two acres for the entire county as if that's relevant. You always got to start zoomed in and then pull out. Okay. So you're going to find the most relevant comping information. You will buy bad deals because you underwrite them inappropriately. If you're looking at things from a county perspective, county perspectives might be okay to kind of start the pricing process or to start making generalizations for creating offers in your mailer. But as we know, offers in our mailer is typically not the price that we do deals at. And so we need to take a very micro approach when we're going and comping our deals. All right. So our property is somewhere up yonder, right? You can see that there's this nicer part of the subdivision down here that's like more cleared out in the valley. Our property is not down there. Our property is back in these hills. If you'll remember, zoom in. Our property's right here. So there's like this little valley here, all right? Little valley here. Our property's up yonder, okay? So what I want to start with? Well, I want to start with properties that are as similar to ours as possible. Oh, hey, here's an 18.6K listing for this two-acre property, 2.26-acre property, okay? Funnily enough, I actually think that's our listing. <laughs> but you could see how that would be relevant. Huh? If that wasn't our listing, I would say, great, great data point. Our property's right over yonder. This is very close to ours. We've got this one down here, which is five acres at 20K. Now, this is something that's important to look at. I'm not positive, but if I think if I look at the photos here, I'm pretty sure it looks like there might have been, was there a fire at some point? It looks like there was a fire at some point here. I don't think that was recent, but that definitely is going to hinder values. I don't think our property had any burnt patches on it. So this is a kind of a different portion here. We'll talk about that here in a second. But what we're going to do here is we're going to start as close to our property as possible. We'll start, slowly start zooming out. Now for on-market listings, I typically will apply like a 70 to 80% discount rate. Okay. So if the property is listed actively, let's say it's listed at $10,000, to be conservative, I might assume that it's actually going to sell at 7000 or 8000 Most pieces of land don't sell at their list price, okay? So I'm never going to just take these at face value. And frankly, at the end of the day, the best piece of data you can get in this business are sold comps, all right? Sold comps are going to tell us pretty much everything. One thing that I like to look at, though, on these listings, we'll grab both of these, is I do like to look at how long these have been listed. So 67 days, this one's been up for 10 days. Cool. That tells me something. If this listing had been up for 100 days or 300 days or 600 days, I start to get a little more aggressive in that discount rate. Okay, it's been up for 300 days. Maybe it's going to sell at half that price or 60% of that price. If it's been up for an hour, well, maybe it sells at 80%, 90%, 70%, something like that. So you got to take into consideration some of this nuance in terms of how long it's been listed. But Let's go and look at the nitty gritty. Let's go look at what's actually sold out here, okay? So here's this one that sold at $10,000, two and a half acre. This one, again, looks like it was burnt. It's important to know. And then here's this one that sold a little bit down the road, sold at 14.9, 2.38 acres. And then we've got this one, 17.9. This is the comp that we saw over here. This one was an off-market sale, so we can't see any of like the history on this property. So this property here sold for 19, it's at 2.38. Now, the next thing that I'm going to start looking at is what I call features. That's the second part in our comping process. So we started with proximity. We'll get things that are as close to our property as possible. The next thing that I look at are the features. 
Features might be the size of the property, if this property has utilities and the other ones don't, topography of the property, quality of access, is the property burnt or not burnt? Is Does it have tree cover or foliage or is it totally cleared? Those things matter for when we're comping property. So if you're comping a property that's on the other side of the county, so you got proximity wrong and it's got a cliff on it and no trees and your property's in a valley and has trees, it's in a totally different part of town, bad comp. I want to find things that are within proximity, and usually by virtue of being within proximity, it usually means the features are the same, but not always. You've got to pay close attention. So I look at these listing descriptions, right? Maybe this property has a septic on it and well on it. Well, I don't have those same features, so I've got to take that into consideration for how we underwrite this deal. Same thing is like this comp here is not burnt. Our property is not burnt. We have photos of it. So we know it's not burnt, but this property is burnt. So what does that tell me? The features are very, very different. Ours is not burnt. That one is not burnt. This one is burnt. Okay. So what do you think is going to be more valuable, a burnt property or a not burnt property? Definitely not burnt property. So we're just going to go through and look at this. And you can see they tried to list at 17.9 because they didn't understand the nuance of pricing off of features, right? They said, hey, there's other comps at 17.9 at the same size. So ours must be this worth the same. They didn't understand how features work. This has totally different features. And so what ends up happening is they had to take a big haircut on price because this is not worth $17,900. This is allegedly the market sold. This is worth $10,000. Now we go look at this property here who has pretty much identical features to us, right? Ours is 2.26, is 2.38. So very similar size. This is densely wooded like ours. And go look at the history here. Very different story. This is listed at 14.9. Maybe it's sold at 14.9. Maybe it's just saying the Redfin estimate is 19. This sold at 14.9. And this sold in two days. So what does that tell me? They probably priced this a little too low. We want our properties to sell fast. We don't want our properties to sell too fast. So we're always trying to balance speed with maximizing value. So I look at a listing like this, I say, they probably price this too low. And even Redfin is saying, yo, this is worth like closer to 19K. I think they price this one too low. This one here, they obviously priced it too high. And the market told them, yo, this is worth $10,000. So I look at this and I say, okay, this is very similar property to ours. Like as close as we could probably get for like a perfect comp. I, what I will say is this does have slightly better access than ours. The access is a little nicer than this one. But I look at this and I say, I know we can get 14.9 for ours. But I, I think that's too low because they sold too quick. When I look at the other comp that we have here, that sold at 17.9, this is adjacent to ours, same exact features. In fact, ours is a little bit better. And this one wasn't on market, so we can't put as much weight on it. But I'm like, okay, cool. This is, I think, more relevant. And I think this one, they mispriced it. So I think we're somewhere in this pocket here. I know we're not in that $10,000 range, okay? So we've nailed the proximity. We're as in close proximity as we can really get. We've got three comps to look at here that are actively sold. And then the third category that we look at is what I call recency, okay? So this sold June 15th, this sold March 1st, this sold June 23rd. I'm recording this September 3rd. So as close as we can get to the here and now is more relevant than what sold six months ago or a year ago because markets change. They're always evolving. Price is always evolving. So I look at this and I say, okay, we're worth more than $14,900. we are probably not, not worth more than seventeen dollars or $18,000. We're somewhere in this pocket. So we've nailed kind of the three categories. We nailed proximity. We nailed features. We nailed recency. Frankly, I could build a strong enough case just off of this, right? The one thing that I do like to look at is I like to think about what is our competition doing? Because whether you believe it or not, we have to compete with what's on market right? And so you can just exclude this one because it's ours. This is our competition. It's at $20,000 and it's a five acre. And I might be saying similar, but that property is bigger than yours and it's at $20,000. Well, my hunch is based off of the data that we have on sold comps is that people are willing to pay seventeen dollars to $18,000 for a two acre that isn't burnt. We saw that a two acre that was burnt was worth about $10,000. So I actually think this is priced relatively fairly, but believe it or not, even though this is a bigger property, I think our pricing can get pretty close to this, right? So I don't want to get too hung up on properties that again, are not like kind. This is in close proximity. I could see how you might want to make an argument as to pricing per acre, what this is worth to ours, but that's not the case because features are very different. And we've got cold, hard evidence as to what a 2.26 acre property is worth. Now, frankly, I could build a strong enough case just off of this. One thing that I like to do as well as like a little bit of a ninja tip is go see, is there anything under contract currently? So there very well might not be. Let's see. Okay. So there's actually nothing under contract in this little area right here. Now, one thing that I could do as well, we could start zooming out. I really don't feel the need. I think I've built a strong enough case off of the data that we have here, but let's say there was nothing here to work off of, right? This, this, this to me, 
is worth infinitely more than going and getting more comps in different areas. Because frankly, what you can start to do is confuse yourself. So let's just zoom out. Okay, so now we've zoomed out. And what you're going to start seeing here is there's all these comps here that are going to start getting you crossed up. 25000 for a 2.61 anchor. You're going to start thinking that maybe these your property is worth in this range. The truth is, it's not right? And this is the problem with comping. More is not always better. Yes, we need enough evidence to build a strong case to figure out what things are worth. But if you're weighting those comps correctly, if you're weighting them based off of proximity, features, and recency, less is more. And what I see is people that come in that want to comp off of this whole area. Or worse, they want to comp off of the whole county or a big chunk of the county. What's going to start happening is you're just going to confuse yourself. I mean, look at two and a half acres at 68,000, one acre at 215,000. And I start looking at this and I start wondering, well, no wonder people are buying deals they lose money on. It's like you're taking in too much data and you don't know how to read between the lines. 108,000 for this 1.44 acre. And so the problem is, is not about getting more. It's about getting the right kind of comps that follow the right playbook. So remember, it is proximity, it is features, it is recency. Less is more. If you follow that framework, you'll pretty much always know how to underwrite deals. Now, you might be saying, okay, some of that's fine and dandy, but what happens if there's no comps that are within proximity, there's no comps that have similar features, and there's nothing that's recent? You're gonna be in a really hard place. And in fact, when you get into those situations, there are ninja things that you can do, but frankly, as a new investor, you know what's the best idea there? It might just be wise to move on, right? The biggest crux that you can get yourself into is if you have no data. Like we need data to make database decisions to keep ourselves safe in this business. Now, as you get more advanced, there is some nuance that we can pull into that. Again, I could go and take a whole county and start piecing together a thesis on what properties are worth by really understanding how to read between the lines. That's a skill you develop. I can start looking at last sale prices for owners in the area. I can start getting really, really nitty gritty with it. But in more times than not, I would just say it's almost better in that situation if you have no support or no mentoring or no oversight, keep yourself safe and move on. Nothing will ruin your career faster than having your first few deals be break even or losers. That will take the wind out of your sails. And when we're first starting, we've gotta be ultra, ultra conservative. The truth is though, if you're following our market selection process, Process, you're really never going to be doing deals in places where there's no data. Okay. If you follow what we teach on market selection, you'll pretty much always avoid that problem. The problem is there's lots of people that don't. And so they go and send mail willy nilly. They get deals where there's no data to comp them out. And they start making these crazy assumptions based off of huge swaths of data. And they think, well, more data is good, right? They go and buy a deal that they think is worth 60,000 and it's actually worth 18,000, like our deal. You know what I mean? That's a problem. Now, here's the thing you might be saying, okay, Sumner, well, why did you list yours at 18.6? Well, A, there's nothing for us to compete with. The adjacent lot at 17.9. And I think ours is nicer than that property. There's no active listings that we have to compete with in that area. And we always give a little bit of a buffer because every single person wants to buy a deal at a discount, okay? Every new buyer wants to come in and make you an offer that's lower than your list price because they want to feel like, they got to win. They want to feel like they got one over you. And so we always add a little bit of a buffer, right? We always do want to be selling under market price. We've got to be really considerate of like what the market value is and what the other competitive listings in the area are at. We always want to be underneath that. Just because people are listing at prices doesn't always mean that they're at market value. So you got to look at both. What are the active listings at? What are market value? We always want to be over under that. But when I look at this deal, I say this deal is probably going to sell somewhere between 16 and 17,000. So we price it at that 18,000. So someone can come in and make us a low ball off and we'll probably accept it or we'll negotiate them up a little bit. But all they care about is that they're getting a deal slightly under market. So we don't actually price it thinking that that 18.6 is going to be the price it moves at. We think we'll probably get an offer at 17 or 16. We'll probably accept it. And they're going to be super eager to close on the deal. And we can be really aggressive with our terms because we can say, hey, we're giving you a fatty discount. You need to close in 30 days, no due diligence period. You got to cover closing costs. And so we can push our terms onto that new buyer. If the buyer comes in and makes an offer at market price, more times than not, you're going to get pushed around on terms. We have this happen all the time. So we always want to price still under market value, still under what the other listings are at. We got to be competitive, but we want to leave a little bit of margin for them to take from us so they can feel like they're getting one over us, okay? That is our comping framework. Less is more. You don't need more data, okay? You just need the right kind of data. You need to learn how to weight those data points, right? Apply more weight to certain points, and you need to have a clean binary process that you can follow, and then you can teach your team to follow. So again, you can delegate this workout. If you don't have a clean-cut, clear process for comping, 
How could you ever teach someone else how to do it, right? We've got to make it binary and as black and white as possible. One thing to throw in here, you guys can use realtors. In situations where data is very sparse, you can use realtors. It's not a surefire thing that they're going to know what they're talking about. Sometimes they can bring interesting insights to the table. More times than not, though, they don't know how to comp. And that's why we see properties that are mispriced all the time, because realtors don't understand the Leah comping playbook, right? It would be cool if they did. Most of them don't. But if you find an expert in that market, you can leverage them, and they certainly will help you.